Hey, everybody. Not sure exactly what happened there at the end, Jeff, but we're here. Hey, happy Thursday, not Friday. Happy Thursday. We're broadcasting on Thursday because of the Good Friday that is upon us tomorrow. So, hey, welcome all across Alberta, people in libraries and colleges, people in municipal buildings, people in uh, primary care network offices, all over, people in businesses and chambers of commerce, all coming together to do what? To build a better community, to build themselves to build a better community. It's about being a community builder, a new mindset, a new heart set, a new way of doing things. So I thank you for joining us. Now today, we got a lot to talk about, and I'm going to tell you already that we're going to go four minutes over at 1.04. We'll be done at 1.04. So take note, 1.04. Now the last three weeks, we attempted to ignite the fire by looking introspectively within ourselves, by taking that leadership history survey, by thinking about the people that made an impact on us and reaching out to them, by looking at that change continuum, right? This whole idea that you have to have a process for change. And that the only way you were going to be a little bit better tomorrow than you were yesterday is that you had to pick out something and change. Because 80% of your behavior is unconscious behavior. And if you're not completely satisfied with the results that you're getting, then something has to that's right, change. Something has to change. So we got somebody doing something. Oh, they're coming and moving something for me. Isn't that funny? Live broadcasting, right? People running around doing stuff. <laughs> Don't they see I'm an artist trying to do my craft? <laughs> anyway, so, so now what are we going to do? Now we're going to move towards learning the competencies that we believe the times require that we've seen demonstrated in a, almost 200 projects across Canada and beyond. 23, almost now I guess, 30,000 people have utilized to make their neighborhood, their business, their organization, or their community better tomorrow than it was yesterday. Four competencies is what we will unpack over the next 12 weeks. Say, Ian, your voice doesn't sound great. Yeah, remember I had strep. <laughs> Right, my, my voice doesn't sound so great because I had strep. You're lucky I'm here. <clears throat> Anyways, so over the next 12 weeks, we'll unpack those competencies, four competencies. Today and the next three weeks, we begin with the first, an agent of change. But before I dive directly into that, I got to set a framework, a framework so that you understand why the agent of change competency is so relevant today, why it's so meaningful, and why I think it's the number one tool you can have in your toolkit. Look, there's no doubt we're in changing times. And times, they are a-changing and will continue to change, as Bob Dylan said. Drucker, as I've pointed out to you before, said we shouldn't be surprised by this, that it's a, just a natural occurrence in Western society. What's a competency? Oh, do you have your handouts? Hey, no dilly-dallying today, man. I got a lot to cover. No dilly-dallying. Let's just dive into it. What's a competency? Well, a competency is a, is, a, is a complex set of skills, attributes, qualities, and attitudes that make you good at a thing. A thing. A job, a vocation, whatever. Competencies. There are certain competencies necessary to be a good jewel cutter. If you want to be a good, good jewel cutter, there are certain competencies. If you want to effectively drive a front-end loader, there are certain competencies. If you want to be a great hockey player, there are certain competencies. In the coaching session, the question was asked, how come all kinds of people get promoted to positions of leadership and are crappy leaders? That's because oftentimes we promote vocational competency. People are really good at a chosen task. They have vocational competency. Regrettably, though, they lack leadership competency. So a complex set of skills, attitudes, attributes, and qualities that make you good at leading or marshalling human capital or that, that you remember that uh, little visual I gave you? 
getting a whole bunch of different people, this is really important, a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds with a whole bunch of different talents, experience, and interest, and marshalling their human capital towards a common goal. That's leadership today. Not intimidating them towards a common goal, not barking them towards a common goal, not manipulating them towards a common goal, but marshalling their human capital, shepherding their human capital towards a common goal. There are certain competencies for doing that, attributes, skills, qualities, and attitudes for doing that, competency. There's a big difference between vocational competency and leadership competency. I have leadership competency. You say, that's pretty arrogant. No, I've demonstrated. I've demonstrated leadership competency in a number of different fields, in a number of different settings, in a number of different um, industries, in a number of different environments, in a number of different countries and continents. Somehow, I had a bunch of people that taught me and life experience taught me how to get people going in a certain direction. I have leadership competency. I'm not vocationally competent in very many things. I have low vocational competency. But do I need vocational competency? It helps, certainly. But ultimately, leadership competency will trump vocational competency. So what about today? You said, Ian, that, that, that times have changed. Yeah, you know one of the biggest changes that's occurred? Influence. You see, we used to be influenced by authority. We used to be influenced by experts. We used to be influenced by people that had fancy letters after their name. Or we used to be influenced by iconic brands. We found, we found them to be credible and believable. But as time has gone along in the 20th and now 21st century, our vision of experts has eroded. Our vision of leaders has eroded. Our vision of those institutions that we could count on to be rock solid for us, all of a sudden they're not so rock solid anymore. And whether it's scandals or whether it's uh, people lacking fiduciary responsibility or whether it's people cutting corners or whether it's us getting screwed over, whatever it is, there's a lack of trust in today's society. And you and I, we only are influenced by things that we trust. I use the example in the Ignite the Fire of, of booking a trip. That in the past, I would book a trip by talking to an expert. And that expert would tell me where to go and what to buy and give me insight and wisdom and so on and so forth. And I listened to the expert. But today, I don't listen to an expert. Because I don't trust the experts, because I figure they're getting a kickback from Air Canada or WestJet. Or maybe the hotel is giving them a little bit of a spiff on the side, so I don't listen to them. Instead, I listen to TripAdvisor, or I listen to travel website, or I listen to a blog, or I listen to a Facebook page or a post, because I trust them more. Oh, you're talking about word of mouth marketing. No, it's deeper than that. It permeates today's society. We don't trust authority, nor do we trust our institutions as much as we once did. Now, that's not a value judgment. It's just that it is. It is. That's the way it is. And that affects me as a leader. I have to know that people are going to turn a jaundiced eye as soon as I ascend to a position of leadership. But it also presents a tremendous opportunity. Now I don't have to have a title to lead. I just can lead through influence by building trusting relationships with those around me. You say that's not true. Really? How is it that the, the mom can rally a bunch of people on Facebook and get something done in her town? How is it that a bunch of young students can rise up and, 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 and turn over a government? How is it that you and I, who used to snap to authority, aren't impressed with authority anymore? That's a fundamental shift. And we must take that contextual shift into account when we talk about leading people. See, I would suggest to you that there is a trust deficit in the way we view formal leaders and formal institutions. 
We saw that with Let Them Be Kids, our foundation that helps build the playground. And that's why we always would say to groups, don't put in two and three years of planning. Put in about four months of planning. Rally the community. Make it a grassroots feel. Make it seem like it just comes out of nowhere because people will rush to that. But when it seems institutional, when it seems like there's authorities uh, outside that are helping guide the process, when it seems like someone else is making the decision, people don't want to get involved in that. When it feels institutional as opposed to organic, why? Because we don't trust it. Write this down. Today, people have to give me their permission to lead them. That's a fundamental shift. Used to be if I had a title, if I had some authority, people would follow. Today, those days are gone. Today, people will, must give you their permission to lead them. Now, I didn't say they wouldn't come to work. They'll come to work. They got mortgages to pay. They got bills to pay. But will they give their all? I doubt it. Trust. Trust also dry, oh, uh, write this down. Get, people must give you permission to lead them. Have you gotten people's permission to lead them? We'll talk about how to do that over the next three weeks. Finally, trust drives change. People don't get excited about change if they don't trust the people who are talking about the change. People don't get excited about change if they don't trust the process. They might trust the people, but they don't trust the process. People won't get excited about change if they don't trust the outcome of the change. So people hold back. You wonder why people are apathetic. You wonder why you get the crossed arms and the rolled eyes, because there's a lack of trust. Why would I hook my wagon to your group of horses if I don't trust these horses can get me to the end of the journey? Think about it. Why would I put my time, talent, and my treasure into your thing if I don't trust that you'll be a good steward of my time, my talent, my treasure? Think about you personally. You will not hook your uh, wagon to a bunch of horses that can't run. And you won't invest your time, talent, and treasure into something you think will fail. Trust. And the tough part is, when a person has had that trust violated two or three or four times, then they cross their arms and say, I ain't changing for nothing because it's unsafe. Right, Jeff? It's unsafe. I'm going to get let down. I'm going to get beat up. I'm going to get made fun of. I'm going to get ridiculed. I'll just stay in my house. And that's what happens. So we have to take all of that shift into consideration when we talk about this agent of change. So an agent of change understands, this is, the, this is the definition, understands, demonstrates, and exerts influence, because that's the only way that you're going to make people move today. You got you to gotta influence them, just like companies try to get to influence you to make a purchase. Influence them by how? By manipulating them? By, uh, by tricking them? No, by building trusting relationships with them to act as a catalyst for change. So how am I going to get things changed? I'm going to realize the trust deficit that's in the community. I'm going to build trusting relationships with people. And through those trusting relationships, I'll be able to influence and marshal the human capital. Look at the diagram on the next page. Just really, really quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll draw it. You can look at it. Used to be like this, right? Used to be the, the pyramid. The bosses up here, the leaders up here, the followers down here, and poop, poop fold, fold which way? downhill. And then somebody got really wise and said, let's turn that upside down. Let's put the leaders down here. We'll support the people that are closest to the issues and the challenges, the inverted pyramid style of leadership. But I would tell you that both of those are passe. They're both passe. They won't work. Because why? Because there's a fundamental shift. The world has flattened. The world is attitudinally flattened when it comes to leadership. I don't respect authority. You don't respect authority. We're not impressed by institutions as much anymore, so on and so forth. Now the way to lead is based on the amount of space you can occupy on that line. And that space is based on how much people trust you. 
If people trust you, you can influence them. If people don't trust you, you can't influence them. It's that simple. So when you talk about wanting to open a pool in a town, or you want to talk about building a playground, or you want to talk about getting people together for economic development and so on, you better go build some trust first. You better go build some trust first. Turn the page. Now, over the next three weeks, what I've got to do is help you understand how to do this. So you understand it, but now we've got to demonstrate it and exert influence. We've got to have tools to do that. These can't just be concepts. We've got to bring them down to the ground. So I'm going to give you some tools today and over the next three weeks. Within the context of first, how do I build trust? How do I proactively, intentionally, and strategically build trust in my community or in my workplace or in my nonprofit or social profit organization? How do I do that? Oh, Ian, that's right. Really? I don't think it is because I don't think it's a given anymore. I don't think it's a given that people know how to do that. It's like all those arrows going in the different directions that I've talked to you about before. Then, later today, I'm going to give you a way to expand your sphere of influence, a strategy for expanding your sphere of influence with people of influence. And I'm going to give you a strategy for how to get a group of people together to do a project. Now, not today, but in the three weeks, I'm also going to give you a way to change implement change within an organization. See, the agent of change has tools for implementing change within an organization, within a community. And then finally, over the next three weeks, I'm going to give you a way during the coaching session specifically, I'm going to give you a way to change performance. So if you're a leader that manages people, how do you deal with poor performance? See, the agent of change has tools in their toolkit to change performance. So that the, the community builder realizes the context that we're operating in. They're an agent of change. They know how to implement change on a community level. They know how to implement change in an organizational level. And they have strategies and tools to implement change on an individual performance level. And that's what we're going to cover over the next few weeks. All right? All right, let's roll. So let's first talk about proactive trust building. So there's a trust deficit out there. So I got to be proactive in building trust. So let me give you some, what I think are some keys to building trust with other people. First, vocational competency. Whoa, wait a minute. Just a second ago, Ian, dude, you told me vocational competency wasn't as, as important as leadership competency. Follow me here. It does help to know the task. It does help to have some mastery of some tasks. It does help to be vocationally competent. Now, what if you are leading some people and they know and you know that you don't know what the heck you're doing? Notice I didn't say the other word because we are Nadia friendly. We're Nadia friendly. We're not using words like that anymore. I did say heck though. Hopefully that doesn't offend anybody. Listen now. What do I mean by vocationally competent? Well, you know the task and you can demonstrate that you know the task. But Ian, what if I don't? What if I get promoted as a supervisor? Or what I get elevated as a director? Or what if I go on a board and I don't know? No big deal. You know what you do? You do this. I don't know. Yeah, that's what you say. You say, I don't know. How many of you ever had a leader or a boss that tried to fool everybody into thinking they knew what the heck was going on? And we, you knew, and they knew, and everybody knew they didn't know what was going on. So what do you do? You just stand up and say, I don't know what's going on. But then you have to put a, a, a comma and bring some kind of value to the followers. So write that down. If I don't have vocational competency then in the chosen task or endeavor, then what value do I bring? Is the value that I bring I'm good with working with other departments? Is the value that I bring that I'm, I, I go out and find and research information? Is the value that I bring, I'm a good team builder? I'm a good listener? You see, followers don't mind. If somebody gets promoted who doesn't know what the heck they're doing, as long as they bring some value to the team, if they bring some value to the team, they'll respect that. Somebody posted in the chat box uh, before we began a question around, hey, uh, I've got to lead all these people and they want different things from me. Don't worry about what they want, just bring them value. If you can make their work easier, more efficient, more effective, simpler. 
If you can clear the brush for them, then they're going to perceive you to be a quality leader, even though you may not be vocationally competent. So either go gain some vocational competency or admit that you don't have it and then bring some value. And that's key. What value are you bringing to the party as a leader? And I think that's a proactive exercise. Next, open communication. Now, later when we talk about systems, I'll talk to you about how to move away from the open door policy into more proactive information gathering strategy. Or how you as a municipality or an organization within a community can be great at identifying thoughts, ideas, and concerns. But for now, open communication. Listening is a proactive exercise. Communication is a continuum. Now, I'm not going to go into depth of it today. I'm actually going to post a video on communication. It's awesome. Awesome. And if, you, if you're inclined to need to improve your communication, I'll let you know when that's posted on the portal and you can go check it out if that's something that you feel like you need to put in your toolkit. But for now, I want to talk about four ways that people filter communication. You see, in the past, the boss said, you all will communicate like I do. Today, that won't work. Today, that won't work. As leaders, we must be willing to bend our communication style to meet the needs of the stakeholders that we're working with. And I don't just mean language. I mean style. Four communication styles. The first, the fact-based communicator. Now you think, I'm, you may be thinking I'm talking about someone who likes numbers. Not necessarily. It's someone who is sequential in their communication. They want to know this, and then that, and then this, and then that, and it has to be sequential. Otherwise, you'll lose them. Sequential in their communication. It, they do le lean towards numbers. Like you want to follow, some of you that are fact-based communicators, if there isn't a stream of consciousness that's easy to follow, you get lost. People lose you. Then there's the emotion-based communicator. Now remember, I can't build a trusting relationship unless I can effectively communicate. In the past, in the past, people would be used to bending to the leader. That's not going to be the case anymore. So if I want to build a trusting relationship with another human being, I, I'm better off if I bend my style to theirs. But then i got to be able to identify their style. So second, emotion-based communicator. You know somebody like that. They communicate however they're feeling right now. Whatever they're feeling in the moment is what you get. The emotion-based communicator. Then there's the values-based communicator. Now, now, let me be clear on what, what I mean by values. We all have a unique set of values, the way we, we run our lives. Not necessarily religion or morals, but the way we run our life. I mean, even the mafia has a unique set of values. And if you understood those, you'd probably have a better chance of communicating with them. So, values-based communicators. Then you have belief-based communicators. Now, what I mean by that is this what they believe to be true. Have you ever met with somebody and, and you talk with them and you explain it to them and you lay out the facts and so on and so forth and they, they look at you like this. And when you finish talking, they say this. Well, that's all great, but let me tell you what I believe. What they know to be true. And it wouldn't matter what facts you showed them. It wouldn't matter what examples you showed them. What they know to be true. Four communication styles. Now, what's funny? The next time you watch a truck commercial, Dodge, Ford, Chevy, whatever, you'll see all four communication styles in play. You will literally see all four communication styles in play. You'll see the fact-based communication. What's that? The towing power, the torque, the, 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 the gas, and how, how many kilometers it can go on a tank of gas. That's the fact-based communicator. And where does that usually happen? Down on the bottom or over on the side? The values-based, that's the dog in the truck with the man and the kids. The emotion-based, that can be uh, the, the, the deep voice. Oh, if you're any kind of a man, you drive this kind of a truck, otherwise you're a wussy. Or the half-naked girl on the, on the hood of the truck squirming all around, which has nothing to do with the truck. Why do we have the half-naked girl on a truck? I don't know. 
but the emotion of it all. If you drive this truck, you might get this thing. You might get this girl. Or the belief, you know, that's where they die, the, dri- the truck drives up and, you know, there's a Canadian flag waving in the background or whatever, you know. All of that combined. Why? Because people spend billions of dollars understanding there's four communication styles and in one minute they make sure they hit all four. How about when you write a grant? Or how about when you make a presentation? Or how about when you stand up in front of a group and speak? Wouldn't it be in your best interest to have a little bit of each one of these? Or when you sit down to talk to another human being, wouldn't it be in your best interest to kind of think about what their communication style is and then bend yours to meet theirs? Do you think you might have a better chance of understanding them or they understanding you or building a trusting relationship? Yeah, but how would I do that? Listen. What? Listen. Listen. Listening is a lost art. You see, we got all these electronic devices and all that kind of stuff, and we've lost the art of listening. The ADD society, the narcissistic society that we're in, we've lost the art of listening. There's no substitute for paying attention. There is no substitute for paying attention. And there's no more powerful way to build a relationship with a human being than that human being feeling understood. If you sit down in a meeting and a person walks away saying, Ian really understands me, do you think you have a better shot in alignment with that person? I guarantee you, you do. If that person feels understood, well, the key to that person feeling understood is you listening. So here's your assignment for the next week. I'll remind you on Monday with a short email, but your assignment is twofold. I'm going to give you a tangible and intangible way to practice listening. First, the intangible. For the next seven days, I want you to listen to every person that's in front of you like they're going to die at midnight. Well, that's pretty morbid. No, no, listen. If the person that was standing in front of you at any given time, if you knew they were leaving the planet at midnight tonight, God forbid, what would you do? You would give them your full focus, your full attention. You would listen with your eyes and your ears. You would listen with your intuition. You would listen with your all. You would listen to every word. You wouldn't be thinking about the next meeting. You wouldn't be thinking about picking up groceries. You wouldn't be thinking about the meeting that just happened or the emails that you need to answer. You wouldn't be worrying about the text that just came on in your phone. You would be focused on them. Why is this so important today? Because if you want to get alignment, if you want to build your sphere of influence, be a listener. Do 80% of the listening, 20% of the talking. Try to understand people's needs, their hopes, their wants and desires. If you want to build trust with others, try to understand them to their satisfaction. And when a person feels understood, there is no more powerful tool than that. Okay, that's intangible. Now let me give you a tangible exercise. You see it right there. It says assignment. Assignment. I want you over the next seven days, and you'll have two weeks to complete this though. I want you to send out a survey. I want you to send out a survey to the, if you're a, if you're a leader already, a formal leader, you supervise people or manage people or direct people, then I want you to send out this survey to your direct reports. If you don't formally lead people, I want you in any organization, business, nonprofit, board member, it doesn't matter. If you don't formally lead people, I want you to send this survey out to stakeholders you work with or interface with on a regular basis. Survey. Now look, it's a listening exercise as a way to gain feedback, but it's also a trust building exercise. I'll show you how in just a second. So the survey is going to have three questions. Question number one, what am I doing right? Question number two, what am I doing wrong? Your suggestions for my improvement. Question number three, if you could send me back to school, what class would you make me take? Now in the coaching session, I'll give you some some insight to what the responses could mean. But let's talk about the purpose of the exercise. In today's day and age, trust building isn't static. It must be proactive. Let me ask you a question. If you got a, a survey like that from a formal leader and they told you that you could submit it anonymously and they told you 
that they were going to take the insight and wisdom that they gained from the various people and they were going to work to get better. And then you saw them take the feedback and you saw them actually work over the next 90 days at some of the feedback they gained. And if they were transparent about the responses they, they got, Jeff, would you respect them more? Would you trust them more? Or at least you'd be open to trusting them more. And if they did that consistently, Jeff, every 90 days, would you trust them more? Absolutely you would. So feedback is the breakfast of champions. You can't wait for people to walk in the open door. They never will. This is a phenomenal way for you to build trust with people by saying, tell me what I'm doing right. Tell me how I can get better. Give me your suggestions for my improvement. I'm going to look at the trends, the things that people tell me I need to get better at. I'm going to immediately get better, work at getting better at them. And I'm going to do that consistently. Now, how could you do that? Well, you could just type it up on a Microsoft Word doc, hand it out to people and tell them to turn it into your box or under your door or whatever, just as long as it's anonymous. You could set up a little monkey survey. If you know how to do that, it's free. Or you could use Google Apps. There's a survey app in Google Apps. If you're a big Google person, you could go in there and do a little survey thing. You could email it out to people. They could respond anonymously. They don't have to email it back to you. Whatever you do, don't send it out and say reply to all. What's the point, Ian? The point is that you need feedback on your own performance. True, strong leaders in today's day and age are transparent, authentic, and sincere. What more transparent and authentic and sincere exercise than this? Especially after I explain to you what some of the responses could mean and what to do with it. You stop and think about it. Somebody sent that survey out to you and then you saw them taking your suggestions and doing something with it. And you saw them doing that regularly. Would you be more willing to trust them with your time, your talent, and your treasure? The answer is you'd at least be more open to it. For sure. I used to do that every 90 days. When I had 1,100 employees, every 90 days. My direct reports got to give me feedback every 90 days. And everybody, all 1,100 people twice a year. Three simple questions. Because I wanted to build trust with people. So I could marshal their human capital, their love, their sweat, their energy, their effort. So I could get them to run through walls, to come in early and stay late, to give their best to the cause. Because they trusted me as a leader. I wasn't very competent vocationally, but I knew I had to build trust, and that's a trust-building exercise. On Monday, in the email, we'll recap the exercise, explain it, and it's about a minute and 43 seconds so that you can execute the exercise. All right, now look. Finally, we trust. If you want people to trust you as a leader, then you better be, have clarity of outcome and impact. Outcome-based impact focused outcome based impact focused people aren't going to give time talent and treasure to something that isn't clear outcome or impact let's let's use an example a pool let's say i want to get a pool in my town or a, a splash pad playground whatever and i'm a mom and i don't have a big sphere of influence before I go around trying to get everybody excited about a pool, I better be able to communicate in fact, in emotion, in values, and beliefs, the potential positive impact through the outcome of the pool. Well, it's obvious. Kids will have fun. Well, no. What's the economic impact of the pool? Well, we know this. We know crime will go down because we know that petty crime happens between 3 and 8 o'clock after school, and if we can get kids in that pool, and if we can get kids to learn how to swim and be fit, reduce childhood obesity, so those are two ways that we can make a financial impact, reducing of crime, petty crime, and reducing of childhood obesity. Then a pool is a community gathering space, and it's a tool for community connectiveness and community building. See, I'm starting to already clarify impact. And it wouldn't take, it wouldn't take very long to put some numbers and some dollars to that. But don't just stand up and say, we need a pool because it's good for the kids. And a bunch of people in town are going to be like, I don't have any kids. So you've got to be able to communicate outcome and impact language. Or another way to say it is, why? 
Why would this be good for the town? Outcome impact. Finally, what's the, another way to say it would be, what's the value? What's the value of this? If you can't explain the value, the outcome and the impact, you're stuck. Law enforcement does an amazing job of communicating outcome and impact. You talk about budgets. As soon as we start talking about budgets, any law enforcement person is well-skilled at saying, cut one penny from our budget, the apocalypse will occur. Heck, don't, if you, if you choose not to raise it 15%, the apocalypse will occur. Now look, don't bash me. You know, like, well, are you against law enforcement? Heck no. Remember, Let Them Be Kids has honored RCMP officers all across the country. I'm just saying, they're really good at outcome and impact language when it comes to budget time. They are able to articulate outcome and impact. How about you? Are you able to articulate the positive impact fact-wise, belief-wise, emotion-wise, and values-wise to your community of the thing you want to do? Can you tell me the financial impact it will make, the moral impact it will make, the social impact it will make, and the value thereof? If you can't tell me that, then don't go walking around town trying to get a bunch of people involved because they ain't going to get involved. Right, Jeff? They're not going to get involved. So before you begin... That will build trust, like becoming a community builder. The first thing we forced the local committees to do was develop outcomes. And if they haven't communicated that out, shame on them. If you don't know what the outcomes are in each one of your local communities, let me know. We'll send them to you or we'll connect you to the committee so you know what the outcomes are. Because that was the first thing we challenged them to do, develop outcomes. Because you can't get people to buy in if they don't know why the hell we're doing it. Ooh. That's two. Sorry, Nadia. If they don't know what the heck you're doing it for, okay? So these are three ways that you could proactively, proactively build trust with people where there might be a trust deficit today. Either be vocationally competent or bring some value to them, but identify that proactively so you can deliver. So there's no gap between what you say you are and what you do. Make sure that you understand the four communication styles and bend your style to meet those of the stakeholders. Listen like they're going to die at, like you're going to, they're going to die at midnight with your full focus. Do some kind of survey gathering. I gave you a simple one that you can do on Monday. And then make sure that before we do anything, we're clear in the value of the thing that we're doing, its outcome and its impacts to not only on us, positive, but all those around us. All right. So now I've given you a way to build some trust. Now I want to give you a way that you can expand your influence in the community. We call it 100 cups of coffee. Check this out. Hi there. We're from uh, the Rockyford Library. And my name is Gail Garfin, and this is... And I'm Tracy. And Jocelyn. And we participated in the Becoming a Community Builder program. There's a section in there um, called 100 Cups of Coffee, and I have actually put it to good use. I have had my coffee with uh, certain people, and uh, I have a, um, a project now in progress, so it definitely does work. And we Thank feel you. like go-getters for sure, so yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's well worth it. Thanks, Ian. Great meeting Thank you. you. Go Rocky Bird! Yes! <laughs> I love those ladies from the Rocky Bird Library, man. The Rocky Bird Library! Woo! And you know what? Those three ladies and the other people from Rocky Bird, kicking butt. That lady on the left, on I guess it would have been on your right, I guess, on the screen, she's getting it, man. She's getting after it with the 100 cups of coffee strategy that I'm about to talk with you about. Now, this strategy, 100 cups of coffee, is about relationship building and expanding one's sphere of influence. Every project that I've ever done, I had no influence. That's not true. No, trust me, it is true. Nobody knows who the heck Ian Hill is or who the changing point is, and yet we're doing a provincial-wide initiative. No one knew who Let Them Be Kids was or Ian Hill was or Jesse John or Dan Carter, and yet we did 161 projects across the country as far away as Africa. 
We had to have some way to expand our sphere of influence. The way that I'm about to walk through with you is exactly what we did and exactly what thousands of leaders now across North America, informal leaders in communities across North America are utilizing just like those ladies in the Rockyford Library. There is a guy, happens to be down in the States, he's used this strategy to build a cohesive group of over 5,600 people in a small community in Illinois. Remember that guy, Jeff? Remember that guy? Jeff was there when he stood up and talked about it. He thanked me. Ian, thank you for this. I got 5,600 people on board for community building now. Crazy, using this strategy. All right, we call it 100 cups of coffee. But I want you to hear why it's effective before we go into the nuts and bolts of it. In today's day and age, to penetrate the volume of media, information, and white noise that people are hit with, you have to have some kind of strategy, some kind of tool. Did you know that people in your community, even in the smallest of your communities, get hit with 17,000, on average, 17,000 media impressions a month, TV, radio, iPad, website, flyer at the Sobeys or Canada Post, you know, word of mouth. I just get inundated with stuff. How do you think your task or your endeavor or your initiative or your program is going to penetrate that? It's not going to penetrate it by sending out a Facebook post. It's not going to penetrate it by, 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 by putting up a flyer. It's not. It's just not going to happen. You have to have something more. Today, more than ever before, the personal relational effort makes the greatest impact, especially when it's executed through people of influence. So here I am, a nobody. And that's the truth. I'm a nobody, man. In the whole grand scheme of things, nobody. But I see an injustice. I see a wrong. I see something that just ain't, ain't, ain't right. I want to do something about it. Well, I know I can't do it on my own, so I got to expand my sphere of influence. So let's talk about how you can do that. Oh, one last thing, important in the context. I would suggest to you that people are looking for something of meaning, something of purpose, something of value to connect to. People are looking for something of meaning, something of purpose, something of value to connect to today. I don't believe it. People are apathetic. No, no, they're not. No, they're not. Look at how much time they put into their Harley. Look at how much time they put into their car. Look at how much time they put into their crazy little activity or their kids' hockey or their kids' soccer or their kids' dance. People aren't apathetic. They're irrationally passionate about things. You just got to make your thing something that they get irrationally passionate about. Does that make sense? So people aren't apathetic if they can plug into something of meaning, of purpose, and of value. So look, 17,000 media impressions a month. People desperately looking for something of meaning, purpose, and value to connect to. So what strategy would take those two things into account? We call it 100 cups of coffee, a relational strategy. Now, there's a lot of words here on the next two pages. And not this week, but the following week, I'm literally going to send you little, for four days, I'm going to send you little two-minute emails to reinforce this concept. But for now, let's just walk through it quickly. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a list of three people, three people of influence, three people of influence, three people of influence, one, two, three, who you need on side to get done what you need to get done. Now look it, I'm not talking about people of prominence, I'm talking about people of influence. We all know somebody of prominence that everybody thinks is a joke. Just because somebody know, just because people know this person, just because everybody knows this person, doesn't make them a person of influence. So who are those people of influence in your community? Who are those people of influence in your workplace? Who are the people of influence? I'll walk into a classroom, I'll see a teacher has a title, but some kid's running the class. 
Everybody says we need to get the general manager, the CEO on board of our project. No, we don't. We need to get his executive assistant on board or her executive assistant on board. We need to get to the mayor. Do we need to get to the mayor? Or do we need to get to that individual that, that filters everything for the mayor? We need to get to the, the minister. Do we need to get to the minister? Or do we need to get to the deputy minister? Or the deputy deputy minister, who's been there for 26 years and is the gatekeeper? Influence. Do I need to get to the principal of the school? Or do I need to get to the mom with the loudest mouth? I need to get to the mom with the loudest mouth. Influence. So in today's day and age, I need to connect. I need to expand my sphere of influence by connecting with people of influence, not people of prominence. So I make my list. And then I'm going to color code them based on how they feel about me or the thing that we're trying to do. Could be red. What does that mean? They don't have a clue. Not that they're against necessarily. They just don't have a clue. Or they could be against. Then yellow. They're indifferent. They're indifferent to what we're doing. They know about it, but they're, they're, they're indifferent. Oh, okay, whatever. Doesn't matter to me. I don't care. Green. They like what they're doing, but they're not necessarily what we're doing, but they're not necessarily a champion for the cause. So through a hundred cup of coffee strategy, what I'm going to attempt to do is move these pe people of influence one notch. One notch. I'm not going to try to get them from red to green. That's unrealistic. All I'm trying to go do is build a trusting relationship with them. That's it. Trying to find a place that I can connect with them. That's it. No agenda, no manipulation, no trying to give them to give money, nothing. Just go build a trusting relationship. Now, those people of influence that you've listed, you may or may not know them. But probably, especially in the towns that a majority of your size is, if you don't know them directly, you know somebody that knows them. So whether you know them or you know somebody that knows them, you want to try to meet with them. Now, the advantage of a relational approach is that you'll know their style. You'll know if you have to set up a formal appointment or if you can just drop by their office. You'll know if you need to actually send them an email and talk to their assistant to make it happen or if you can just call your friend who knows them and set up the, the little try meeting over a cup of coffee. You'll also probably have some insight into their communication style. Fact-based, emotion-based, values-based, belief-based. So that you're prepared to adjust your style to meet theirs. Well, then you want to set up a cup of coffee, a meeting. In that cup of coffee, you're going to do 80% listening, 20% talking. You're going to do nothing but open, ask open-ended questions. You're trying to understand their needs, their wants, their desires, their hopes, their aspirations. Yeah, but when do I tell them about my thing? You don't. You're there to build a trusting relationship with them. You want to expand your sphere of influence? Expand the trusting relationships that you have in the community, even with people who don't agree with you. You see, when I sit down with you, and I talk with you, and I learn from you, and I glean information from you, and you walk away thinking I understand you, I've made a huge step towards alignment. I've made a, made a huge step towards you feeling as though we have a common interest. Remember, change is about trust. It starts with trust. So if I wanted to initiate change in Chestamere, or if I wanted to initiate change in Grand Prairie, or if I want to initiate change in any of your communities, I would make a list of the people of influence and I would go start building trusting relationships with them. Well, I already know everybody in town, Ian. Yeah, but do they trust you? It starts with them trusting the people that are advocating the change and then they got to trust the process for the change and then they got to trust the outcomes in the change. Otherwise, they're not getting on board with the change, especially in situations where you have people that have been in positions of authority and power for a long, long time. And now you're talking about turning up the apple cart upside down and doing things a whole bunch of ways. Don't you think they're going to hold? Now, you could call it old boys. You could call it whatever. But don't you think people are going to hold? Of course they're going to hold. So wouldn't you need to go build those trusting relationships with them? Kiss their ring. Genuflect. You know how many rings I've had to kiss in genuflect? 
to build a trusting relationship? No, look, I'm not compromising my values. I'm not compromising my integrity. I'm just acknowledging that they helped build the town. I'm just acknowledging for the last 30 years, they were the people that put in the money and the time and the energy. I'm just acknowledging what is duly theirs. They should be acknowledged and honored. So I'll go build a trusting relationship with them. And when they see the authenticity of my heart, when they see the sincerity of my cause, when they see that we have some outcomes and impacts that are relevant and meaningful, they're more likely to align. Now look, in that conversation, I'm seeking to understand, as Covey taught us, seeking to understand. Once I, I only, I don't sell, no selling. I only begin to talk about my thing when I perceive that they believe I understand them. Then, and only then, am I attempting to show how what I'm doing is in alignment with what they're doing. Look at this. It's a user-driven society. I taught you that before. It's a user-driven society. So I'm going to let them talk. It's a user-driven society. I'm going to listen like they're dying at midnight. I'm going to understand to the depth that I can possibly understand to their satisfaction. Then and only then do I show them how where they're going is in alignment with where I'm going. Now that might take a hundred cups of coffee. Be authentic, be sincere. Be outcome-based, be impact-focused. When you tell stories, make sure they're specific and relevant to their cause and their hope and their dream and how we can further their thing. You want to build alignment, be known as the person that helps other people reach their dreams, their goals, or other organizations further themselves. Everyone will want to align with you when you build that reputation. Well, that's pretty Pollyannish. It can't work. I'll tell you time after time after time that I've seen it work. But it begins with your willingness to go have those 100 cups of coffee. In this very simple, authentic, personal approach to recruitment, building of partnerships, and most of all of growing your sphere of influence, you will not only convey the essence of the value of what you are doing in real and meaningful terms, you will also do it in a way that inherently builds trusting relationships. Now, as I said, not next week, but the following week, I'll hit you with four little quick emails that will unpack this in a, in, a, in a meaningful and profound way. We can't cover it in 10 minutes, right? I just want to lay it at your feet, get you thinking about the 100 cups of coffee. You heard from the nice lady in the Rockyford Library. It's already working for her and getting things done in Rockyford. So in those four emails, not this week, coming week, but the following week, you'll get it a little bit more detailed and unpacked in short two, three-minute blips, okay? All right, turn the page. I told you we're going to four after, so I've got about 14 minutes left. Is that right, Jeff? 14 minutes left. Now, you see two pages of handouts. Well, three pages. The first we're going to go over now. Then you see a page that we're going to go over in the coaching session. How do I change performance of an individual? How do I coach performance of an individual? How do I get someone to do their job better than they were doing it before? And whether job means... Paid or job means volunteer? How do I coach performance? Agents of change coach. Agents of change have strategies for changing performance, and I'll give you some in the coaching session. All right? All right, let's get to this page, though, first. Now you've got to have a way to change things in a community. Change things in a community. How do I launch something? And secondly, how do I implement change in an organization? Before we can talk about any one of those two things, we got to talk about people's reactions to change. Vision drives change, outcome-based, impact-focused. When the vision is compelling, people get excited. Remember I posted on Facebook a couple of days ago, I posted the whole idea of the ship. If you want to build a ship, don't go around trying to gather wood and timber and, and money. Don't do that. If you want to build a ship, cast the compelling vision of what the voyage will be like. Cast the compelling vision of what the destination will be like if we all build the boat and get on it and go over there. Don't go around trying to get timber and money. Cast the vision of the journey and the voyage and how wonderful it will be. Vision drives change. The greater the clarity of the vision, the more likely people will change. 
the deeper the trust of the people that are articulating it, deeper the trust of the process, deeper the trust of the, of the outcome, more likely that people will have an appetite for changing. There's five reactions to change. Five reactions to change. And it's important anytime we implement change as an as a, as a, as a, uh, agent of change, I have to take these reactions into consideration before I begin any change. How many of you have ever gone through a crappy change? How many of you are still dealing with the residue of a poor change that was executed by some other leader? And whether that's on a community level or organizational level. So vision drives change, and there's five reactions to change. I think it's in our best interest to look at stakeholders and, and try to guesstimate how they might react so we can build strategies and plans accordingly. First, we have the early risers. Who are these people? These are people that just like change, like this morning. This morning, my wife, Gina, who I love to death, changed her hair color today. And you know what? She does that like every 90 days, man. Seriously. I'm like, Gina, I like your hair the way it is. Oh, I want to change it because she loves change. She just, she's got an itchy foot. She likes change. You know people like that, early risers. Then there are the early adapters. These are individuals that are good with change as long as you can explain the reason behind it. They're good with change as long as you can explain the reason behind it. Then you have the crowd. Now, next to them, you could write sheeple. They are sheep people. Sheep people. <laughs> the crowd. Now, I'm not being disparaging. They're just people that say this. Man, nah, it's fine with me. I don't care. I'm good. Whereas in other issues, they might be fired up. But in the thing you're talking about, they're good. They don't, it doesn't matter. If the polarity of the group is negative, they'll pull negative. If the polarity of the group is positive, they'll pull positive. They're the crowd, sheeple. Then you have the legitimizer. Now listen, this is really important. The legitimizer is the person who gains their legitimacy from the crowd. They will say or do what the crowd is unwilling to say or do. They're the person that stands up in the public meeting and asks all the questions. And you think they're a resistor to change. They're not. They care deeply. They just don't want to get messed over again. They just don't want it to, 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 to be a waste. They care. And if you can get that legitimizer on board, solid as a rock, man. And then finally, the resistor. Now look, it's completely unrealistic to think, completely and totally unrealistic to think that you can get 100% of people on board with the change. Don't even try. But look at these percentages. Look at the percentages. 25 or 20% 20 of the people are early risers. 20% of the people are early adopters. Just give them an explanation. 20% of the people are the crowd. They're going to go, whether it's positive or negative, they're going to pull one way or the other. Then you have the legitimizer that deeply cares, so you better have your outcome-based impact focus language down. You better have built the trusting relationship. And you better know it. You better have some vocational competency or build, bring some significant value, you or your group. And then they'll, they'll, they'll find you to be legitimate and be more likely to get on board. And then there's 20% of the people that no matter what you do, they're going to be against. That's important to know why. Because when I implement change within an organization, which we will not go into today, I'll tell you when that video gets posted. And if you're in business, or if you're a leader of a, a social profit or a governmental entity, when that video gets posted in the portal, you'll want to watch it because it talks about a, a strategy for implementing change. It's very, very good. But for now, if I wanted to launch something in a community, how do I get connected to the early risers and the early adapters? How do I get them? How do I find them? So in the next six minutes that I have left, six minutes, is that right? In the six minutes that I have left, I'm going to walk you through how I would go about identifying the early risers, the people that are excited about change, and the early adapters, the people that are down for change, if I can give them an explanation of why. How do I get the next concentric circle to me? This is exactly what I've done the seven times we've done things that have never been done before. First, I make sure that thing I'm going to do really breaks my heart that I am deeply and sincerely, irrationally passionate about it. Then, for two weeks, two weeks, 
I'm going to do nothing but talk about that thing everywhere I go. Not how to solve the thing, just about the thing. Can you believe the homeless situation? Or can you believe we need a new blank amenity? Or can you believe this tragedy or difficulty? And I'm not bashing anybody. I'm just expressing how it's breaking my heart. And when I go to the arena, I talk about it. And when I go to my place of faith, I talk about it. And when I'm in work, I talk about it. And just for two weeks, I talk about it. For two weeks, I'm talking about it. Everywhere I go. And I'm gauging people's reaction at the Rotary Club, at the Lions Club, at my place of faith, at the ball field, at the arena, at the wherever, at the Sobeys. I don't care. I'm just going around talking to people, all my, all my people that I know. And I'm seeing who has interest. I'm seeing who does this. Yeah, that's great, Ian. But anyways, they're out. Or people that lean forward. Or people that think intently. Or people that say, I thought the same way. I'm identifying those people. Now, what is this called? It's called a market survey. I'm doing a market survey. I'm seeing who might have some interest. Now, concurrent to that, every night, I'm taking 15 minutes. I'm studying about that thing that breaks my heart. I'm going to the University of Google, and I'm studying about that thing that breaks my heart. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Every night when I come to sit down, I write down the names of people who showed some interest as I walked around and talked. At the end of that two weeks, I have a list of people that showed interest and a list of people that don't. The people that don't, I move to the side. Now I got the people that expressed interest. Now for the next two weeks, so we're a month total now, next two weeks, I'm going to circle back to that list of people that expressed interest. Maybe they expressed it with their body language. Maybe they expressed it verbally. Maybe they expressed it however they expressed it. But they seem to have some interest. And I circle back around to them. And that sounds something like this. Hey, you know what? Remember that thing I talked to you about the other day that's breaking my heart? Yeah. I've been doing research every night. 15, 20 minutes a night, I've been going to the University of Google, and I've been doing research. And you know what? Here's what I found. Here's the best practice of this, and here's what they're doing to solve that here, and here's how they're fixing that here, and I've been doing research. And if they look at you like this, wow, that's great. Anyways, take them off the list. But they'll be that group that is interested. Wow, that's interesting. Oh, they're doing that there? Wow, that's nice. Oh, we could do that here. So you go home every night and you make your list of the people that showed interest. So you probably started with 60 or 70 people that you talked to. That whittled down the first time to 20 or 30, and then that whittled down to 10. Now what are you going to do? Now I'm going to go to each one of those 10 people and say, hey, over the last couple weeks, you know this thing has been on my heart. You know this thing has been burdening my heart. You know I've even been doing research about it, and you seem to be really interested every time I've talked to you. I'm having a little get-together at my house, or I'm having a little get-together over at the office or at the bar or whatever, and I'd like you to come, and I'm gathering some like-minded people together to talk about this thing. No agenda, no, no commitment, no, we're just going to talk about it. Now, of those 10 people, four are going to show up. But what do you know about those four people, Jeff? You know they're in. You know they're committed. They had to jump over four hurdles or three hurdles to get in that room. And you let it be a user-driven process. Aha! A user-driven process where you just casted a vision of something that needed to be fixed and they expressed an interest. And then they expressed an interest. And then when you made the ask, they showed up. Yeah, but what about all those other people that didn't show up? Who gives a crap about those other... Oh, sorry. Who gives a darn? Who gives a heck? Who gives a you-know-what about those other people? You're not going to build off those other people. What do I know about those four people? I know they're in. And then what's the next step? What do you think the next step is, Jeff? Do the exact same thing with their spheres of influence over the next month. They go put in 15 minutes a day studying the University of Google. They talk to everybody they know in their sphere of influence. And what will you have after two months, eight weeks, you'll have a core group of about 15 to 20 people on your team. And they'll all be there, not because they're your friend, but because they're committed to the cause. Then you can start talking about beginning to implement a change. And I'll tell you how to do that down the road. But that's how I would launch a project. 
That's how I would get something off the ground. The first four weeks would be about doing a market survey and researching, casting the vision, see who's an early adopter and an early riser, and then work from them. And then the next four weeks would take those early adopters and early risers and fan them out into the community to do the exact same model. At the end of that eight weeks, I'll have anywhere from 10 to 20 people who I know are on board. What if nobody comes on board, Jeff? Then you know what you know? You know nobody cares about your thing yet. You still got some work to do. You still got some work to do on the outcomes and the impact. You still got some work to do on building those trusting relationships. You still got work to do on the influence, expanding your sphere of influence. You put out the market survey, nobody cares. So you table it for a little while. You table it for a little while. And then you do it again in six months or eight months. That's the simplicity. All right, we've come to the end of our time. All I'm doing today is taking this concept of the agent of change and laying it at your feet. Now I got three weeks to unpack it in small blips, small blips, and post some videos that if they're relevant to you, you'll watch. Last thing, after the coaching session, after you've sent out that survey to people that you interface with regularly, who've given you feedback of how you could get better or what you're great at now or whatever, I'm gonna start asking for your commitment. Remember, to participate in this program, you got to make a commitment. A commitment of what you're going to do. What are you going to do with this program you're getting for free? What are you going to do in your house? Or what are you going to do in your company? Or what are you going to do in your organization? Or what are you going to do in your community? What's your commitment? So know this, after the coaching session, in two weeks, I'm going to start asking for your commitment. Because all of this is a joke if we don't have 1,100 people make a commitment of what they'll do to make the world a little bit better tomorrow than it was yesterday. I know as we speak, there is a, a guy making crystal methamphetamine within 200 kilometers of your residence, and he wants to sell it to our kids. I know as a fact that there is a, some pedophile trying to figure out a sexual predator, trying to figure out a way to snatch a, one of our kids off a playground. And alcohol and abuse and neglect and poverty and ignorance look to destroy our communities. All I'm asking you to do is make a commitment of what you'll do. I don't ask you to do a million things. I'm just asking you to pick out one thing. Agent of change understands, demonstrates, and exerts influence by building trusting relationships to act as a catalyst for change. I thank you for joining us. I'll be in the chat box. Sorry we went a little long. Have a great day, everybody. There comes a moment when my heart must stand alone On this lonely path I've chosen Like a house that's not a 